The Asphalt Art Program is administered by FC Moves, the Transportation Planning Department of the City of Fort Collins. The Paint Pot Program is a grant-funded asphalt art project made possible through a grant from the National Association of City Transportation Officials. With special thanks to Bike Fort Collins and Jillian Betterly for programmatic support. This storytelling project is a collection of voices from the neighborhoods where the asphalt murals were painted. Several of the voices are Indigenous, Hispanic, and Latino community members with long generational ties to the neighborhoods called Tres Colonias, or the Spanish Colonies. This episode features Doug Cordova from the Cordova family in Alta Vista during the installation of El Corazón de la Colonia by Moses Oqueli. Okay, my name is Doug Cordova. We're in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, in the Spanish colony, Alta Vista, wh- whatever you, you want to call it. I think that the city calls it Alta Vista. The people that originally settled here call, uh, refer to it as the Spanish colony. Yeah. So I didn't grow up in Fort Collins. I know a lot about the history just from my own research. And I was fortunate enough because I started in 84, kind of researching the family that I interviewed my um, grandfather's sibling, a couple of his siblings. And so I, I got more of the background. And it was really amazing how much information she gave me that I would never have found um, had I not talked to her. And almost, I would say, 95% of what she told me was 100% accurate. By way of background, the most of the people that used to come up here before the 20s from uh, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, they consider them manitos. And I, and I always tell people, if they ask me, what's your father's background, I tell them it's New Mexican because it really is a culture uh, of its own. And, and I will tell, and I tell people, if your family has been in New Mexico or Colorado for 200 years, you're, prob- you're probably a cousin some one way or another. And, and I think Mexico is a very unique culture because it has both the Spanish influence, and there weren't that many Spanish, you know, they came up in three waves after the Pueblo Revolt in 1680. There weren't that many Hispanics, so they married into the Indians. And so it really is, Although there are other tribes involved, um, it is largely Pueblo Indian and Spanish uh, background. And so the individuals that used to come up before the 20s, like my grandfather used to come up here and herd sheep in, uh, in northern Colorado and southern Wyoming, and they would also work the farms. And they would leave literally for months at a time and leave their families behind. So if you didn't have um, older boys at home or you didn't have an older uh, maybe uncle or something that was there the women did most of the work and I, I remember hearing stories of my mother's or my grandmother's mother just hiking up her dress and tying it up between her legs and going out and working the livestock or or whatever was required there on the farm fortunately for them she had a, a brother that lived with her we used to come up here as well but I think um, on occasion he would he would dare to help out so before 1920 that's how they did it and then what happened in, with the, the uh, great the great western sugar company is they actually offered lots here in what we call now the spanish colony and what they did is they they worked out five-year deals so the first year um they wouldn't charge any rent to buy the land and then i think the next three years it was like 40 dollars a year and then the last year was 25 to 50 dollars something along and they did that to try to get the folks here to commit to staying here and so now it it offered an opportunity for people to actually bring their families and so my grandfather um my aunt rosie was born in in cerro new mexico and then they came up in a covered wagon my uncle manuel was born in 1923 so they were already up here my understanding is they lived um they worked on a farm and lived on a farm for the first couple years so in 1923 is when the when the the uh sugar company actually offered these these deals um and this was known as the spanish colony the plots were 50 by 85 feet and and the idea behind the five-year deal was the first year to live there for free and then i think they were priced normally but you had to work or you had to pay them off in a five-year increment you couldn't just go in and say hey how much do you want for this 150 dollars here's your 150 dollars they worked it that way so that the people would be tied to the area and they would remain for the five years and so you know it's the deal hey first year 
you're, you're, we're good. We're good. Second, you just give us a little money, you know, third year, fourth year. And then the fifth year, you give us some more money and it's yours, baby, you know? Um, and that's, and that's how they work. And, and again, um, I think that it was kind of a, a good deal because for those people that normally would travel up here for months at a time and, and, um, leave their families behind it gave them the opportunity to bring them here and i don't know what they expected i mean obviously my grandfather had come up here and worked in the past i don't know what the environment was because it was probably so isolated when they were you know out herding sheep or they working on a farm they may not have got a full taste of of the environment you know if you will but it did give them the opportunity to bring their families here and raise their families here and, and the interesting thing is so the the beat work sugar beet work was a seasonal job so it started in april it ended in october and so there were things to do over that period of time but once that happened um they needed to find something else to do for those uh those other periods of time so i know that my grandfather would uproot his whole family in the spring and they would go up uh up into wyoming to pine bluffs and would work the potato fields so it was always a constant moving um life very very tumultuous as far as you know the kids moving in and out of school and so i'm sure that it was very different than than most of the populace in fort collins in 1927 it was designated by the city of fort collins as the alta vista sub subdivision so when they did plat but the interesting thing about it is even though it was designated um that district it was still considered no man's land they the county didn't consider it part of the county. The city didn't consider it, consider it part of the city. So they didn't have sewage and they didn't have the resources that uh, most of the people, well, that the, that the citizens in Fort Collins had. So it was, it was really, and I, and I have, ref, I have heard that it was referred to in some circles as uh, La Sela, you know, the, the jungle. And so if you didn't belong here, you just didn't come in. And, and really it was just these people existed kind of on their own you know I've, ma I've made the comment earlier today to some people that it really was a, it was a survival with prejudice and poverty because they 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 you know they weren't allowed to go into a lot of the businesses in Fort Collins but they persevered they were very hard-working people they were very determined diligent very pr prideful and very devoted to family and faith and um you know my my grandfather Originally, I, I looked at the 1930 census. My grandfather, my grandmother lived here. His parents lived across the street. His brother lived Caddy Corner uh, from him. And his sister and her husband lived uh, three houses down. So our a, a lot of the, what I would consider to be the fabric of Fort Collins started. I mean, you, you think about how many people just that those four families generated and, and I know that uh, my grandmother passed away in 1984. She had 110 living descendants. Most of them still resided uh, locally in the area, either between Denver and Fort Collins. So you know, just imagine the, the large swath of population that now exists just from that small union. And so you can really get a sense of the significance that they, play, that they played. And, and, and I made this comment earlier. I, I looked at the, the people today um, that are here for the for the street mural and 95% of them were either first or second cousins <laughs> which is which is pretty amazing but it also speaks volumes for the family atmosphere and and so I have 40 first cousins on my dad's side uh, the oldest I think is uh, now in his 80s the youngest is probably almost 40 and so there's a, a wide span of ages but I know most of them and I, I see them every once in a while you know at events like this so I think that speaks volumes for the foundation that we were given as as children. I, I think what you see is pr pretty much uh, the same number of houses that were here. You know, it's funny because I, I've I've heard lots of stories that you know my grandma would walk around and everybody was a prima or a primo. They were they really were all all connected. And my cousin Kenny had said earlier today that where the park is right now was. He doesn't know who owned the house, but it was the first place that he was taken after he was born. So, I mean, it was a very tight-knit community, and probably most, of the, well, most of the houses here originally were were probably adobe. Now, the I do know that the, the factory did provide housing for, in other words, they built houses 
uh, for the workers here. My grandfather's house was built by him. Uh, and and um, there's some dispute, but I've got some pretty good records that it was the first house here in the colony. And he built it adobe brick by adobe brick. In fact, uh, it's still standing today and, and he has the outcrop or the shed garage, whatever you want to call it, which was never plattered. Um, it's open and exposed. And we had somebody come out when we worked the, the museum um, a couple months ago who was an expert in, in Adobe. And he says this was very extremely well built. It's been exposed to the environment since the 1940s and it is still standing. <laughs> it, it obviously um, is a little scary. I wouldn't want to go in it, but uh, it's still there and, and, and it could be restored. I mean, it's still in a condition that it could be restored. So pretty pretty impressive um, to be able to, to do that and do all the work that were, was required for 10 kids. Now, you know, my Aunt Rosie, they, my Aunt Rosie and my Aunt Vi, there's 20, 20 years between them. So it's not like they were all, all 10 of them were in the house at the same time. So it, it is, I mean, when you say they had 10 kids, it's like, oh man, how do you, how do you manage that? But they were, they were over a, a period of time. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, they were very de- devoted to religion and even the church, Holy Family was built because of the people here in the, the colonias. I can tell you that my dad's maternal line is ancient Pueblan. I can tell you that, that his grandmother's line was ancient Pueblan, but I can't tell you what Pueblo they came from. I mean, so then you go back to Chaco Canyon, you go back to these places that we know predated, you know, the move, the movement into the Rio Grande Basin. And I mean, it's just that, um, the fascination with the unknown and with chasing that. And it's, it's an endless, it's an endless search. I will tell you, I am, I'm still turning over rocks and I've been doing this for, for 40 years. My grandfather was actually baptized, um, Jose Dolores Sandoval. And, and that was something that I hadn't gotten through that one of those interviews in 1984, that his father was actually a Sandoval. We are court of us through a maternal line, but both my grandfather and his father were raised by their godparents, who were the same person, Juan de la Cruz Cordova and, uh, and Juana Maria Roybal. Well, Juana Maria Roybal's sister, Francesca Roybal, and her husband, uh, Juan Luis Sandoval, uh, the, the Roybal were sisters, and Cordova and Sandoval were first cousins. So that was one of the things that I have, you know, in my research, I've there was a Juan Miguel Cordova that was born about the same time as my great grandfather, and I, I see people tracing that line because that's what they believe their name was. And so, I wouldn't say surprising, but something that would have easily deflected me in a different direction had I not been given that information by um, my great aunt, you know, back in 1984. Well, I, I think it's very you have to be very careful uh, when you're looking at this lineage and. Um, I've been, I've been working on the family for a long time, and one of the things I would say is what's in the name, because the names really, you really can't rely on them, because if you go back into the, you know, the early 1700s, people took the names of grandparents, they took the names of, of um, aunts and uncles. In, in some circles, if, if there was a more influential family that they were related to, they would take that name. So the, the whole uh, nuance of DNA and how that works now is so so interesting and you, you have to you have to have both the paper record and and the scientific record to, to kind of make heads or tails out of it Juan de la Cruz Cordova um, she told me had a had owned a large amount of sheep he was extremely wealthy and she even commented that he would light his cigars with ten dollar bills which which when you're talking about like 18 late 1800s I'm like that's crazy but she also said he was very good friends with Fred Walson who founded Walsenburg and I actually found um, livestock documents where he owned uh, a very extensive amount of sheep. Uh, unfortunately, Juan de la Cruz was also a gambler, and and he lost most of that wealth, and which also uh, is borne out through my grandfather had um, very nice clothes. They had very nice furniture. They had very nice clothes. Um, unfortunately, Juan de la Cruz Cordova had an accident when they lived down in Seto, and he had a he was out tending the sheep and a wagon had rolled over his leg and he went to the hospital for a, a lengthy part of time and they, that took most of his money. So my grandfather literally carried him 
around. You know, when he left the house, he didn't have wheelchairs. He didn't have that. So he would he would carry him around um, if he needed to go somewhere down home. So and all that stuff, all, you know, just wild stuff. You know, people getting killed. You know, one day La Cruz's brother getting killed by a Mexican native and and kidnapping one of the workers. Well, it all turned out <laughs> to be true. I mean, it's just just crazy stuff. But again, I wouldn't know any of that um, had I not said, I mean, it would have been lost to history. And so when you talk about the oral history, I think, you know, it, it is one of the big problems that we have is you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. And of course, that's the problem with our Native American history is none of it is written down. It's all oral. And so over time, you know, it loses its significance and people you know, don't talk about it. And that's why I think things like this um, and and the, the things that Ashley Cordova has done are so important because, I, you know, I'm, I, I know the whole philosophy behind the ofrenda, you know, but, but it is true. As soon as we stop talking and recognizing our ancestors, we lose them. And so um, if, if nobody takes any interest in that, then the peace is lost forever. And in such a unique culture that we belong to, and, and you can see it, I mean, you can look around and, and see n- not the, um, the mixture of, of other people. And if the story doesn't, isn't told, is it, if it's not written down, if it's not shared, then it lost. And so I have three daughters, uh, you know, they're probably tired of me talking about stuff, but hopefully they'll r- remember it. And, and hopefully I've got a daughter or a grandchild that's interested enough to, to pick up the mantle and say, I, I want to make sure that we keep this going. Because, um, you know, we're discovering things daily with our heritage and our culture and, and that history piece. You know, they're opening records. The great thing about the, the Catholic Church is that they maintained wonderful records. You know, the, the problem is, you know, uh, they were in New Mexico. And so sometimes when they ran out of, I don't want to say when they ran out of toilet paper, but they did use them to maybe patch a hole in a window or, and, and so... The, the records are not always complete and even when they're complete sometimes you know they they were either fire or they were water damaged and so all the ink is run together and so i mean it, you really have to work hard at at defining those lines but again does it really make any difference because we're all related anyways right a lot of the older like in the 1700s it, they did wills and the wills actually list children uh, property division there's a uh, land document so there you know the spanish were good about uh, transferring of property and so all of that are are kind of areas that are still rich with information that that is is yet untapped a, a good researcher is going to say what's your source show me your source and if you can't uh, they should look at look at it very questionably i i got into the um actual documenting the baptismal record. So I go out to family search site and I actually pull the record down, take picture of it. And so I have, I've been tracing back that for the last several years. I retired from the Air Force in 19. And so I've been, <clears throat> for a while there, I was spending probably my wife, wife would tell you too much time doing that stuff. But uh, it is interesting and, and you, you can find a lot if you're willing to take the time to go through the records. It amazes me how how many people don't know anything about their heritage, their culture, where they came from. And, but, they, you know, they'll do the ancestry, right? And so I'll reach out to them because they'll, they'll show as a second or third cousin. And they know they say, oh, that was my mother's side of the family. I don't know a thing about it. I'm like, well, how about asking somebody? <laughs> because there are people still around. And, and, the, and the thing is, I mean, had I not talked to, again, um, my grand father's siblings at an early age I wouldn't know that stuff and so I think I was fortunate you can go online now you can find marriage records you can find divorce records the census um, you know before I guess we started the 1950 census uh, and it just seems to me that um, I, I'm not much interested in my own history <laughs> but I am it, it, and hopefully my kids will be interested in that right I probably should be better at that but part of that is involved when I, you know, when I document my parents, 
my siblings and my my nieces and my nephews so there is a piece of that that get, gets kept alive and I talk about my dad and I would hope that my kids and my grand grandkids talk about uh, my wife and I so um, it requires work and it requires an interest in that and, and I've always been interested in that and I, and I guess I just assume that you know people will be as well but I've uh, I've learned that that's not always the case I do think people are lost. I do think they're looking for an answer, and partially because you got to belong somewhere or to someone or something, right? And and the the, the problem from my perspective is, you know, um, we're all Americans now, but there's so much disjointed and confusion and infighting amongst our own folks that you know people are looking back and saying. You know, what am I? Where am I from? What am I doing? And I think it's interesting that we're having such an influx of, I'll call it Hispanic culture. In in the United States, people tend to think that everybody that has a Hispanic surname is from the same, you know, mindset and culture. And they're not. I mean, hundreds of years of people living in, that's why I say I'm a, my dad's family is New Mexican because for 400 years, that's where they lived, and they they did things differently. Their language is different. Their their culture is different. Their practices are different. You know, they they in, include part of the Native American piece that may be different than the Aztecs or the Mayans. You know, the Pueblans were were different people, and so you you get this whole different mindset in some respects, and and they're not the same. You can't, you know, people in Europe know that too. So you can people from the same country. And I spent some time over there, I know, and, and they can come over here, they can be from the same country, and they can live next door to each other, and they immediately know <laughs> their families are not friends, right? And I, and I think that's a, a great misconception in, in this country that everybody that has a Hispanic surname is the same. What people are going to find is those same values that I've talked about, the, the devotion to family, the faith... Um, to law, um, all of that. It's going to be interesting to me to see how that all plays out, because I don't. My personal feeling is some of those values are are going to resonate above what people think is going to happen, and so it is a very interesting time, I think, for for our country. But but I think it's it it is having a hunger and a passion uh, for the knowledge, and not forgetting. Um, where you came from and I mean it's not a function of you know people say well I'm an American I'm not wherever you came from but the truth is your family came from somewhere else and and I think that it's important to recognize that that's not to say that that um, that overtakes the fact that we are in the country and I mean I served in the military for 30 years I love this country I'll defend this country to the day I die but I still have a, a culture and a heritage that goes to Scandinavia, that goes to Germany, that goes to Spain, that goes to Mexico, that goes to New Mexico. And it's important that people recognize that we are a conglomeration of all of those things and take great pride in them. I mean, you you look at what we're doing right here and what I would say to somebody 50 years from now is you should be extremely proud of all of those people that came before you because had they not, and had they not persevered and had had the tenacity and determination to make a difference, be it education. I mean, you look at the people here, you know, in the 1920s, it, education was a, was a hard thing to attain, you know. And yet, you know, my father went to college. He did it after he went to the Air Force and went, graduating when he was 33 years old. But he set the stage for um, me and my three siblings and all 10 of his grandchildren ended up going to college now is that a is that a, a an important thing i think it speaks volumes to the fact that they they instilled in us what we are 